When I learned I was going to be giving a TEDx, I became extremely nervous. Nervous because I didn't know if the message that I had to relay to you and to tell you to you today would resonate with anyone in the audience. I wasn't sure if I was good enough, and I was listening to that little voice inside my head that said, you know what, because you have challenges, you're not good enough. You're not good enough to come up here and tell these wonderful people a story. So like some of you, I have challenges. I'm extremely short, I'm about four foot 11, but I usually lie just a little bit and tell people I'm five even. <laughs> I have a really funny last name, so my, my maiden name is Balls, B-A-L-L-S, yes, with an extra S at the end. And my married name is Barry, so you, you, know, you take two funny last names and put them together, that, that makes for a few jokes as well. But I also have a disability. And I know many of you may or may not have a disability, and I know you probably wonder what that disability is. So let me give you a little insight. I have dyslexia. Dyslexia impacts about 40 million people. But get this, only 2 million people actually know that they have it. When I was diagnosed with dyslexia in elementary school, you know, many times they called it a reading disability. There was fear of using that term. And here we are again, we go back and forth. Is it dyslexia or is it a reading disability? Dyslexia deals with how we read words, how we decode words. It's a language-based dis disorder. It deals with how we spell and things like that. So here we are, 2016 and we're still debating on what we call this simple word that impacts so many of us. A few weeks ago, actually a few months ago, I received a phone call from one of my best friends from college. She was in my wedding, I was maid of honor in hers, and she has two kids, and she's a healthcare provider. So her youngest child, a, a girl, who I just think is delightful, was recently diagnosed with dyslexia. When her mom called me, when my friend called me, she said, you know, the school, you know, they, they're not helping. And I'm just really confused about what to do. And I said, well, get her tested. And she and her husband went out and they found a clinical psychologist and someone that was a reading expert that could test her daughter. Well, in the testing process, it was confirmed that her daughter had dyslexia. And they took the results back to the school. When they went to the school, the school said to her, well, Thank you so much for this information, and you know, we're glad to know that there are some things that we can do to put in place for your daughter. And now that she has this reading disability and a diagnosis, and my friend said, wait a minute, why aren't you calling it dyslexia? The teacher and the educating uh, psychologist at the school looked at her and said, well, we don't want her to feel any different. Well, guess what? She already feels different. So how is this empowering her? How is this helping this young lady to find her voice and to give her the abilities to learn to read and to motivate her that she can be successful? My friend called the school out on it and they said, no, we need to tell her what it is. We need to work with her. So when I was diagnosed in elementary school, one of my biggest fears was spelling in public. I hated it. Hated it, hated it, hated it. It was like the worst thing ever. So you remember you get that list of like 25 words that you have to spell for the spelling bee and you go home and you practice it and all of that and then you, you, you practice until you know all of them. Well, there was a spelling bee that had the words desert and dessert on them. And my mother said to me when I kept spelling them wrong, well, just remember Desserts are plentiful, that's why it has two S's. So the day of the spelling bee, I go to the classroom and I'm standing up in front of the room and when each child spells their word, they go back and sit down. And I'm hoping, oh God, I hope I get desert or dessert because I know how to spell those. The other ones, <laughs> not so much. Lo and behold, somebody else gets a desert, someone else gets dessert. And I'm standing there like, oh, God, I know I'm going to spell the word wrong. And of course I did. And my classmates are trying to mouth me the letters behind the teacher's back just to make sure that 
that I can too sit down and not get reprimanded for spelling the word wrong. So as time you know, goes on and we get te I get teased a little bit more about not being able to read and not being able to spell in the funny last name, I start the process of reading out loud in, in school and that was hard too. In my family, um, we have a ton of traditions. And one of those traditions is being named after each other. So I'm named after my mom, and my brother is named after my father, who's named after my grandfather, and so on and so forth. Well, one of our other traditions is reading and education. So we had tons of books in the house. So you remember those little golden books? I think everybody had one with Cinderella and Snow White and all of the and three little pigs. So my older brother, who is an avid reader, used to read to me. And I would memorize the stories. So if my parents would ask me to read to them, I would remember what the words were that my brother would read to me so that I could pretend that I was reading and I would guess the words. But guess what, I wasn't reading, so there was a problem. So when we think back on those things and all the help that my parents gave me to learn to read, I'm very thankful. We also have another tradition in my family. My father's father was blind, and we never talked about his disability. It was unspoken rule. You just didn't talk about it. You didn't say anything about it. We just knew that he was blind and he wore really, really cool sunglasses. You know, so you picture this guy that kind of looks like Ray Charles with these really great sunglasses. And he could also play the piano. So most people didn't know. They would come over and they're just like, oh, well, Papa just looks really cool with these sunglasses on. And so because I'm a scientist, and I, I guess I started asking questions early, I felt that that rule of not asking questions about his disability did not apply to me. So I asked him, so how did you feel when you learned you were going blind? And now mind you, he was blind before I was born. His response to me was, I hated it. And I said, really? So last week I asked my dad and his older brother, his eldest brother, I said, yeah, you know, Papa said that he hated going blind, and they both said, yeah, he would have rather lost an arm than not to be able to see his children grow up or his grandchildren. So as I had this conversation with my Papa about how he felt about going blind and his response being, I hated it, I then asked him, so what did you do about it? And he said, well, you know, I had to learn to see differently. And so what he would do was touch our faces to see us, listen intently when we would come in the room. And now mind you, there are 20 plus grandchildren and even more great grandchildren. He could tell who was walking in the room at that time. So he had to learn to see us differently. As time went on and I finished school and my grandparents would soon pass. Before they passed, I remember telling them that I wanted to be a scientist and that I wanted to get my doctorate. And I remember my grandmother and my grandfather both saying to me, if you're gonna do it, then you do it. And so here I am today with dyslexia, helping people learn about literacy as well but not just literacy related to dyslexia and functional literacy of learning how to read, but health literacy and what we call scientific literacy. So I work with African-American women and other vulnerable populations on giving them a voice so that they can understand how to talk to scientists day in and day out and how to read the literature that we value so much. So my challenge to you today is to take that moment, take a step back, think about your childhood or think about that child that you care about. Think about the challenges that they might have and think about how they might have to see the world differently.
And then think about what the motivation is for them to be able to see the world differently. Yes, I have dyslexia. And yes, I'm a scientist at, one of, at the world famous Mayo Clinic. Yes, I struggle still to sometimes get up in front of an audience and read, but don't ask me to spell anything because I'll grab my iPhone and look up how to spell it. And so today, I hope that you take the moment to think back, to find the motivation to go beyond your disabilities or your challenges and know that you are able to achieve. Thank you so much.